in the cannabis space, you would usually see the delayed closing used because you need regulatory approval. And the parties want to know that they have a deal and they're aligned on the points and they're they're basically tied up by signing the purchase agreement, you know, subject to very limited exceptions where the where they could terminate it. You know, for example, if for, for one reason or another the um the you know regulatory wasn't wasn't received, then you could still terminate it. But usually you'd see a, de- a delayed closing, so that's something to think about. Welcome to A Higher Law, a cannabis podcast from the Dykema Law Firm. I'm your host, John Frazier, Michigan team lead of Dykema's Cannabis Group. For more episodes, you can find us at dykemapodcast.com, youtube.com slash dykemalaw, or by searching A Higher Law wherever you get your podcasts. On today's episode, we'll be discussing the world of cannabis M&A and best practices for structuring deals in this complex industry. Uh, I'm delighted to have my colleague, Joe DeHaan, co-leader of Dykema's M&A Group, joining me today. Joe, w- welcome to A Higher Law. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. Thanks, Joe. Can you give our audience just a, a quick snapshot about yourself and your practice, and what does it actually mean to be the co-leader of Dykema's M&A Group? Uh, yeah, so so Dykema does so we do deals um, mostly what we would call the the lower middle market, which you know we define as you know roughly um, you know companies with an enterprise value somewhere between the the ten million dollar to you know two hundred three hundred million dollar mark. So that's what we would you know a lot of the deals that we see that's sort of where the purchase price falls in um, with you know this the, the sweet spot. You know, probably being the, you know, fifteen twenty million dollar deal up to the you know eighty hundred million dollar um, transaction. Um, so that's, I mean, that's what my practice focuses on is is um, you know M and A across different industries. Um, but you know that's that's um, that's that's you know that's that's generally the types of deals that Dykema does. Okay, and M and A is such a broad term. For folks, uh, you know, I think every time I hear m and I always think back of uh, the Christian Bale movie, American Psycho, where everybody is just in mergers and acquisitions and there's no clue on what, what it is they actually do every day. When we talk about m and what are we actually talking about in terms of transactions? Are we always just merging two companies together or what are we actually looking at here? No. So the way the way when I'm. You know, if I tell somebody, if I'm at a party and I tell somebody I'm an M&A attorney, their face you know, immediately goes blank and they go and try to find somebody else to talk to. So the way I, I usually describe it is, you know, I say when one, you know, when one company wants to buy another company, you know, we help, we help make that happen. Um, so there's lots of, lots of ways to structure, um, you know, M&A transactions that, you know, the, you can you can structure it as as a equity sale, where you know the buyer is actually purchasing. You know, if it's an LLC, they're purchasing membership interest. If it's a corporation, they're purchasing stock. Um, so they're they're buying the the equity interest of the company. You can structure it as an asset sale, where the the buyer is actually just just buying the assets, and in in, in some cases, buying only certain assets from the seller that the buyer wants to purchase. Or you can do a merger, which effectively, you know, combines the the two companies into one. Okay. And so the cannabis space obviously has been a highlight for merger and acquisition activity. Um, Can you think about generally why one approach might be used over another uh, in the cannabis instance? Are you seeing a lot more stock? a lot more traditional mergers or um, a lot more asset sales. Yeah, I think you see more you see more asset sales. Um and the the reason for that is because in most cases for an, for an asset sale the buyer is is just basically picking up the assets that it wants, acquiring those and you know other than certain liabilities like maybe current liabilities or accounts payable or something like that. The buyer isn't assuming liabilities from the seller entity. 
Um, that's different than than an equity deal where the buyer is going to be acquiring the whole company. And so if there are liabilities, you know, even unknown liabilities, those would those would likely end up being the buyer's responsibility moving forward. Um, and that often, you know, you know, often is not a risk that buyers are willing to to assume. The, I guess the one the one caveat is is you know one of the first things we always do when we are are deciding the structure for an M&A transaction is also you know tax attorneys involved because um the you know we always want to make sure we're we're structuring these in a tax efficient manner and that to help drive uh you know what what type of structure we use as well. So Joe, taking a step back. Can you can you walk us through how one of these negotiations would get started? I, I imagine most folks don't wake up every morning thinking, "Oh, today's the day I'm going to sell my company," and then you know they're off to the races. Can you walk us through kind of what you see in your experience as to how an M and A transaction actually gets started from a negotiation process and walk us through? Yeah, so so they can start out in a lot of different ways. I mean, the the most probably the most common way is that the you know the company the seller company decides you know hey it's 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 time to for one reason or another they want to sell the company and they go to an investment banker and the investment banker then reaches out to its contacts uh, three and they know each other and they see you know hey there's value if we were to combine our companies together there's value here um so it, it can happen that way as well either the you know a seller just approaching uh, you know, someone else that knows in the industry or a buyer, you know, who's looking to, you know, acquire uh, a company in a certain, a certain area or that, that has maybe a, a certain uh, niche that it's looking for. Um, they may reach out and, and start the negotiations. And then once that process gets started, the first step is you sign a letter of intent, which is, you know, basically just like a summary of the key terms. Um, and then once the letter of intent, and that's it, it's the letter of intent is non-binding, but still, you know, gets sort of the deal on on paper, so everybody's aligned on the key points, and then that's where things would really get get rolling, and you start doing due diligence and start you know, negotiating the actual you know purchase agreement. Yeah, and I obviously I think another common way is you're just existing business partners, and you're already conducting business with each other, and. Like anything in the world, personality is maybe just as important as anything. And if you're a good personality fit and a good culture fit, sometimes it's, it makes good sense. To say, hey, let's let's combine our two businesses, and uh, we'll we'll both have a better business for it, right? Yep, ab- absolutely. You you can see kind of that, um, you know, sort of mergers of equals where there's 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 companies and they just they realize that they're you know putting their two companies together is more valuable than them each trying to operate separately. So taking a, a look now more specifically at the cannabis space, in your experience, Joe, what kind of nuances or differences do you have to navigate through when you're conducting it and negotiating and working on a cannabis related M&A transaction? There's a few things to to think about. You know, one of the one of the first ones is is there there's there's two ways to sort of structure uh the closing of a transaction. One is you you do it where it's called a simultaneous sign and close, where you you sign the you know, the main purchase agreement and you close on the same day. The other way to do it is called a delayed closing, where the parties sign the purchase agreement, but then certain contingencies need to be met in order for the closing to actually occur. Um, so in in the cannabis space, you would usually see the the delayed closing used because um, the because you need regulatory approval and the parties want to know that they have that they have a deal and they're aligned on the points and they're they're basically you know tied up by signing the purchase agreement you know subject to very limited exceptions where the where they could terminate it um, you know for example if for, for one reason or another the um, the uh, the, you know, regulatory wasn't wasn't received, then you could still terminate it. Um, but that's usually you'd see a, de- a delayed closing. So that's something to think about. Um, due diligence is also there's, you know, there's certain aspects of due diligence on cannabis transactions that, you know, don't necessarily 
come up in other in other industries. Uh, so one example would be if um, like real estate leases. So if if it was you know a software company acquiring another software company, and you know all they have is one office lease. Well, if I'm the buyer, I'm probably not too concerned about that lease because you know even if if the even if there's only a month left on the lease, or if I need the landlord's consent to assign the lease, um, you know, it's if that somehow got terminated for one reason or another, it's not that big of a deal because I get to go lease office space a block down the road and it doesn't impact my operations. And cannabis real estate is much more critical. Um, so, you know, you want to look at the real estate leases. You need to know, hey, hey can I assign this lease? from the seller to the buyer without getting the landlord's consent. If I need consent, you, know, you need you, you need to reach out to the landlord. You want to reach out to the landlord early on because if that's going to be an issue, you know, that's potentially uh, a deal killer where in other industries, it's not even something that would you know, raise an eyebrow. Oh, and, and I'm just going to say, circling back to the, the regulatory approvals, right? That, that becomes something that just becomes endemic to the transaction it, itself, right? And, you know, this is where Joe and I get to work together a lot is, yeah, I serve in the regulatory council role. And so when we're negotiating transactions, this is where I get to chime in on, you know, is that closing time frame realistic, given what this municipality is going to need to approve or the state regulatory agency is going to need to process this transaction. And uh, for larger transactions that cover multiple different jurisdictions, right, multiple locations and multiple different municipalities, Every one of those municipalities is going to have its own regulatory flavor and, and approval process. And so that makes teeing up a closing really, really an elaborate uh, dance because we have to tee up all the dominoes to basically get regulatory approvals, maybe for four or five or more different municipalities and the state regulatory agency and everything in between and not line up all those dominoes into a nice, beautiful concert where we can knock them all down at the same time and um, and actually close the transaction. So this is where, you know, you, you really need, uh, you know, not just somebody like Joe who understands the structuring of the transaction, but you'll need regulatory counsel, obviously weighing in to make sure the conditions that you're laying out to close are achievable and, and that really everybody is on the same page right at the time of, of signing the documents because the last thing you want is y'all agreed to a time frame that's just completely unworkable and now you're all fighting over over what to do next from the jump so i you know i i think that's um, that's super helpful and, and joe um what else are, are you looking at as far as um, cannabis related transactions what other nuances come into play um, so there's the real estate, there's, you know, there's, there's things like, um, yeah, how do you value, how do you value inventory? Um, if there's, there's plants, how do you value, how do you value those? Uh, um, how do you take into account that you, there, there could, maybe there's plant, there's, um, you know, product that's drying and, you know, if usually if, you know, any cash that's at the company at closing, the seller gets, so, you know, how do you deal with the the you know kind of tension where the seller is going to want to sell as much of the product as they can versus the buyer who's going to want as much of that in the company? So there's different mechanisms you can use to to deal with that issue, um, but you want to make sure that you deal with that and discuss it up front and that it's addressed in the purchase agreement, so you don't have a problem you know two days before closing where the buyers not getting what they think they were getting. Or you know even worse that that the, that after closing, you know there was there was apparently a dis you, know, you could find out there was a disconnect between what the buyer thought they were getting and what the seller actually um, you know thought they were supposed to be providing, um, and you end up in a in a dispute over that. Right. It's that's that's a great point because that you know the value of the company is going to be probably greater as a going concern but obviously if you're if you're on the manufacturing side you're a cultivator or a processor the asset values and the assets that are going to be sold aren't going to be fixed and so that's a great point joe is to account for what do we think are going to be natural changes in the business as a going concern and how are we going to value fluctuations in the total amount and value of the assets being sold and that's 
that's a great point. So Joe, kind of looking at the cannabis industry in that kind of broader macroeconomic environment, what are you seeing with respect to how the interest rate environment is playing into cannabis m and Are you seeing it accelerate m and or contract or how are you seeing things play out? So we're generally seeing the higher interest rates have caused m and to, to contract. Um, 2000 or 2023 was uh, was an okay year for M&A. It was a little bit of a down year um, for M&A. Uh, yeah, and a lot of that had to do with rising with rising interest rates. Um, so there's there's ways to there's things though that com- that sellers and buyers can do. There's things they can do to help um, you know alleviate some of the pain from higher from higher interest rates. So one thing that that we're seeing more of is that the the sellers are agreeing to have the purchase price paid over time um, via a seller note. So you know it's a seller basically providing financing. So you know instead of the buyer needing to go out and get financing at twelve percent or fourteen percent or what whatever it is that they can get from from you know like a private lender, um, you know the seller might agree to you know, basically finance the sale at, you know, 6% or 8%. Um, and then, you know, it, it helps make the the business case for the acquisition stronger. The other thing that that we've been seeing more of are called earnouts. Um, and earnouts are, um, you know, basically the, the seller agrees that they'll get a certain purchase price up front. And then if, if the business hits certain metrics moving forward, um, the seller could receive additional purchase price. So those those are ways to help you know, help structure the transactions. Like, you know, in in the cannabis space in particular, there's been, um, you know, I think people people thought 2023 was going to be a really big year for cannabis M um, and A, and there was there is certainly some cannabis m a but a lot of the transactions were more um distressed transactions where you know it was companies that were that were struggling um that were being purchased um rather than the you know the you know i think what was originally anticipated you know we were sitting here talking a year ago um and that's actually you know when we we have daikama does a m a outlook survey every year and um when we did the survey you know, a little over a year ago, you know, was it, we, the survey results showed that people expected that cannabis was going to be one of the top five um, industries for M&A in 2023. Um, and then we just did the survey again a few months ago and, and cannabis had dropped, you know, out of the top five, I think down to number eight. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll see what 24, 2024 has uh, in stock for us, but, but, you know, it'll be interesting to see to see exactly what happens and if we start seeing you know less less distressed deals and um more of the you know traditional purchase and acquisitions yeah that's a that's a great point and on the distressed side obviously we've this has been a familiar refrain for for frequent listeners of the podcast but the the federal illegality rears its head uh, for the cannabis space in ugly ways frequently and and causes a great, great, great consternation for, for the industry and for the folks working to advise the industry. And this is another example in that the bankruptcy courts are closed generally to the cannabis industry because bankruptcy courts won't administer the Schedule One assets. And so a lot of these companies are in this, become you know fall into a vicious cycle where they have bad debt that would be make them a good target for a bankruptcy to restructure all that debt and have a good, healthy business with a manageable debt obligation at, at the tail end at the exit. But that, that, that path is just completely off the books. And so I think that will start to become and continue to be a driver for m and activity in this space in particular, because if the debt doesn't work, the only thing that makes sense is to, to sell the business to somebody else who might be able to try and make it work and, and unburden yourself from, from that bad debt. Um, and so I know many operators out there are probably feeling the pain and, and are, uh, can know exactly where I'm, where I'm at on that. And 
hopefully we can we can see some relief in some way, shape, or form to help ease that that burden at some point in time here. Show what what else uh, do listeners need to know on on the M and A front? Where do you think twenty twenty four is is going to be? Do you think we'll see more or less this year? Uh, I, you know, I think we will see a little bit more. I mean, I think hopefully the, you know, the, the, you know, first half of the year, a company has become a little bit stronger, you know, have stronger, stronger balance sheets. Um, you know, and that, and then, you know, that's, that's, what's gonna, you know, that could potentially help, help the m a market, um, for cannabis businesses. And obviously we've got big things that we've talked about previously on this podcast and that if we get rescheduling, then 280E issues go away and maybe the the balance sheets for these businesses look a lot healthier from a tax perspective. And there's a number of changes from rescheduling and other things that we've talked about before. We're still waiting and watching. We'll keep you updated if any of those things happen. Um, but obviously those changes could, could dramatically change and alter what the M&A landscape looks like. And I think it'll probably move it up and, and, and increase the amount of transactions that we see. Well, that's it for us today. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you very much to my colleague, Joe DeHaan, for being being here today. Joe, we hope you'll join us again on A Higher Law here in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me. And a reminder, you can find us by searching A Higher Law wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, I'm John Frazier, and we look forward to seeing you next time on A Higher Law.